Hi, I'm Phil Craig. And I'm Andrew Loney. And together we aim to bring you the most scandalous stories and some of the most scandalous people in history. So thanks for joining us here on the Scandal Mongers podcast. Well, lots happening this week. An opportunity to look back and to look forward, I think. It's been nas- national and international Andrew Loney week. Well, there's more coming. There's a there's a Daily Beast piece about to appear, which we'll be talking about the the, the, the podcast. Right. Well, uh, I mean, so if you've managed somehow to avoid it, if you've been living in a cave somewhere in uh, Patagonia, you may not have noticed that there's been about fifty stories about Andrew and his work on Prince Andrew and Fergie, and some of the things we discussed in last week's podcast. It's been, I don't know, it's been amazing. Yes, yeah, so it's been great, and we're getting lots of feedback uh, on the podcast people are looking at some of the previous episodes and we're getting some very good viewing figures aren't we i mean i'm just looking uh at so valentine low is still our, our top our top uh interviewee i think it's what four and a half no. thousand um people Mo- who movie it, star good people. looks will get get them in every time was that no thirteen thousand, wasn't it for the last one and, yeah. and four and a half for the first one yeah that's but, i mean these figures are just youtube we don't really know about apple yet but they, we yeah. tend to get more listeners than viewers but um, maybe people just want, want to want to look at Valentine. I don't know. No, that, uh, well, they like us. You, you, you. I'm compared to George W. Bush, uh, and you're compared to a comedian called um, Jim Gaffron. Yes, Jim, one, of our, Gaffron. one of our American friends said that, and I have to confess, I don't know who Jim Gaffron is. <laughs> he's a very good-looking, successful man. You should be pleased. Oh well, I am pleased. No, we had some great comments actually, didn't we, this week? Uh, Joe Marsh, if you're listening, Joe Marsh sixty two on Twitter saying, um, I love this podcast. They delve beneath the scandalous headlines to find very human stories that lie beneath, that are overlooked by the tabloids. They bring a humane touch to controversial topics, but are not afraid to reveal the truth behind figures like Churchill and Mountbatten. That's good, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, and also in the historian about town voted us one of the best history podcasts, it recommended the excellent range of topics and the many scandals that were new to her. Indeed. So... We're getting there. Nice mix of old and new. And we're getting lots of good suggestions and lots of good feedback. I mean, interesting, I thought the woman who said that um, uh, we we talk about the need for for the royal family to be less racist and employ more people of colour. But actually, what about Asians working for the royal family? Very few of those. Uh, And they're a much higher percentage of the population, certainly here in Britain. So uh, some yeah. interesting interesting debates being generated by what well, we've there, been there was There was one man called Phil Craig who leapt to your defence online when somebody accused you of being a paid shill for Prince Andrew. I don't know why they yes, said that. That's but very said, kind of you. I said, no, you must never question Andrew's journalism. Behind the exterior of the bumbling schoolboy, public schoolboy, lies a mind like a steel trap. Uh, right. Which I believe. The person, <laughs> behind that bland exterior is an even more bland interior. <laughs> well, it's interesting. All I was saying was with Andrew was that we need to just go back and look at the evidence. I didn't rush to any sort of judgment. Uh, I mean, clearly, there's lots of things he's done which have not helped his cause. But it's interesting. And people are, are very quick to judge him. And and one of the things that happened yesterday, I tried to place an article about his time as a special forces pilot. And the papers didn't want it. They said, that's not the narrative we want to project. And this is extraordinary. I mean, this was a man who had a you know good pilot, clearly doing very dangerous work, should be getting the credit for it. And they don't want to run that story. That's interesting. Um, Actually, in a way, that's not a bad way to link into our subject of this episode, because um, it's very much about stories that you can tell and stories that you can't tell. Um, we're going to talk about COVID. Uh, and we're going to be talking to Matt Ridley um, in a minute. Um, Matt's one of the first serious journalists and reporters really to dig into the, at first they were just hints and suggestions that the source of COVID may not have been some natural process of evolution and and through some kind of market. It might actually have been the result of a leak, uh, unintentional or otherwise, from a germ warfare lab in Wuhan itself. Yes. And I mean, I think this is increasingly the view. Um, but I mean, he's backed it up with a lot of very serious evidence, very balanced and measured. I mean, a very articulate man. So I'm looking forward to hearing what he has to say. The politics of it are so interesting because when Trump was president, he was somehow associated with this with this view. And so therefore, a lot, a lot of people just didn't want to believe it because they didn't like Trump. Hey, I don't like Trump. But 
um, that's slightly separate, isn't it? Or it should be. But And then Biden, slowly but surely, he seems to have moved the American government's position. And now there's big inquiries going on and more and more people are coming forward to say, do you know what, guys? It might well have come from this lab. In fact, it yes. was quite likely. Well, we're getting a lot of intelligence reports. And unless this is spin, this seems to be the evidence has been accumulating and collected. And I've even heard stories that this is part of biological warfare and it all went wrong. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear what he says there, whether it's an offensive or defensive thing. Interesting. All right. Well, I think we've done enough showing off for one morning. Shall we go to Matt? Well, are we going to talk a little bit about what's happening in the future as well? Because we've got several guests coming up. Oh, OK. I thought we could do that at the end. But why not? Let's do it now. Should we do it now? Well, I mean, we've got... Um, uh, we're talking about the Mitfords next week, a uh, subject that people wanted. We've got Randy Tarabelli, who's a well-known American historian. Uh, we're looking at the David Kelly case, which is a great mystery here about a uh, an official who was found dead in rather s suspicious circumstances. And I know we have very different views on the Kelly death, so that'll be interesting. Um, because well, I think people don't expect us to agree with each other, um, <laughs> no, or of course even not. with our guests. It's quite interesting no. that we don't. It's, it's a lost yeah. art civilized disagreement actually it's a lost yeah. dying art well also and i think the great thing is one can be persuaded of other people's point of views i mean one wants to listen to the arguments indeed one does yes all that's coming up soon um and i'm really looking forward to it feels like we're hitting our stride um let's see if matt can put more into our stride should we do it absolutely all right see you in a minute matt thank you so much for joining us thank you I mean, Andrew and I were just talking in a little introduction. That this is the biggest story of our lifetime, probably. Um, maybe the end of the Cold War, maybe the war in Ukraine. But it's so massively important. And yet, from reading your book and your articles, it seems that we've not really been allowed to talk about it, at least where it came from. Is, is that fair? Uh, I think that's exactly what's happened. We have had an extraordinary degree of consensus that nobody must mention the war, uh, i.e. nobody must mention where this virus probably came from. Um, uh, the evidence that it came from a laboratory is not overwhelming, but it is very strong, and it was very strong from the start, and the scientists who knew the most about it knew this, said so in private. We've seen another tranche of emails released overnight that show them using the phrase, it's frigging likely that it came from. Now, these are the very scientists who are telling me at the same time that it couldn't have come from a lab. So I feel very betrayed here. I, I uh, uh, Because I've got some uh, genomic and molecular biology expertise, written about it for many years, a lot of people were asking me in early 2020, could this have come out of one of those labs in China? And I said, no, it's been ruled out by scientists who know more than me. That was a big error. I was trusting people I should not have trusted because those very people in private were saying the opposite. Um, and uh, uh, people like uh, Christian Anderson, Robert Gary, uh, and others who were testifying before Congress this week to try and explain their, 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 their double standard. Um, uh, and uh, gradually, over the succeeding three years, an enormous amount of evidence has emerged that the coincidence of this virus appearing in the place and at the time it did, in the year after, they started doing pretty spectacular experiments on this kind of virus, in the city where they started doing these experiments, <laughs> is really uh, all you need to know. Uh, you know, this is not just any Chinese city. This is the city with the biggest collection of coronavirus, of SARS-like coronaviruses in the world the biggest research program on them, uh, and with the biggest uptick in that work around 2018. And why were scientists saying this to you? Um, I mean, why weren't the, was it to do with their funding? Or was it to do with not offending the Chinese? Well, that's what we, we're trying to get to the bottom of, is, is quite why there was this cover-up. Um, and uh, it 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 emerges from their emails that they were concerned about the impact on so-called international harmony. They were also concerned about the reputation of science. Um, that is to say, if 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 you admitted that one lab had done something uh, risky and dangerous, then 
the entire reputation of science and biotechnology and vaccine production and virology would be under threat. And it would give succor to people who uh, want to stop that kind of research. And that's a genuine concern, but it's been made far worse by the cover-up than than if they had initially said um, uh, that, that there was uh, uh, you know one corner of virology. But there's also a funding aspect. An awful lot of academics have become very dependent upon Chinese uh, finance, Chinese uh, students, Chinese collaborations, um, uh, and they did not want to. And, and there was there was a, a, a strong push coming out of China to say, "Don't you dare blame us Chinese. That's racist. That's unpleasant, etc." To which, understandably, people reacted by saying, "Oh well, no, no, we don't want to blame you." But I mean, I had a conversation with a very British, with a very senior British scientist, um, a very well-known figure, not that long ago, who had been warning about the dangers of biotechnology for many years. And I said, uh, you must be feeling vindicated. And he said, no, not at all. I think it's very important that we never find out what happened. Mm. And I said, you can't be serious. You're really saying it's important we didn't find out how a pandemic that killed, we reckon, 20 million people started. Uh, and he said, no, it's important we don't find out. Uh, and the reason is because it would um, do such damage to international relations with China that uh, it, 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 it would be worse than, than, than not knowing. Tommy. Do you think I just find that attitude very strange? I mean, I I just <clears throat> take the Solzhenitsyn view that truth is more important than consequence. Well, I couldn't agree more. Do you think it would have played out differently had Donald Trump not been the president? Because certainly from my perspective, looking at social media like everybody else did at the time and reading articles, because Trump initially said some kind of slightly offensive things about China, used the phrase Kung Flu, didn't he? And was also seen to be a little bit you know, close to to, to, to right wing figures who would would not hold back criticizing China. Is that one of the reasons that the sort of you know the great and the good and the liberal intelligentsia of the world, people that run newspapers and maybe who were then running Twitter and Facebook, basically said, "Oh no, well if Trump believes it, it can't be true. We have to block it." And they did block it. I mean, people suggesting this stuff that you can now talk about openly were were banned from Facebook for even mentioning it. Yeah, no, I mean there was a it was a conspiracy theory that wasn't allowed to be talked about for most of 2020 until about May of 21 when Facebook and others admitted that they'd been wrong to censor this topic. Um uh yes, there is undoubtedly a degree of um uh, not wanting to give Trump an inch uh, in this. Uh, but if you look at the time scale the 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 the, um, uh, the timeline carefully you find for example that the first time trump was asked about this was at a press conference in the white house uh, i think i can't remember which date it was but it was early march of 2020 i think might have been february and he uh, he didn't answer the question he said anthony fauci is here he will answer that and Fauci came to the microphone and said, um, there's a paper coming out. This is the famous Proximal Origin paper written by those scientists that I mentioned um, that is going to completely uh, do away with the idea that it came out of the lab uh, once and for all. Uh, and I'll get that paper to you journalists as soon as I can. Uh, and Trump said nothing. A week later, Trump said was asked, have you seen any evidence that it came out of a lab? And he said, yes, I have. Um, it definitely did. So the timeline is not quite as clear as you would think. In other words, the, there, was a, there was a sort of getting your, getting your retaliation in first going on. You know, there was a degree to which the scientists were making up their minds to shoot down this theory based on what was coming out of well, one paper out of India and one paper out of China in February 2020 suggesting it was a lab escape. The Chinese one was only 
on uh, online for a few hours before it was taken down but it was from a husband and wife team with uh, uh from inside a lab saying we think this actually came out of a lab they weren't in wuhan they were in hong kong um uh the the indian one was more problematic because it said we think this looks like it's connected with hiv and there is a uh and it erected a conspiracy theory about um working with hiv which was a red herring and was was right to be shot down if you like and so it react it was reacting to that that the scientists closed ranks rather than reacting to anything trump had actually said but you're not wrong you know they did anticipate that trump would jump on a, a lab link bandwagon to bash china um so he his his the his presence in the white house certainly made it harder because his presence in the white house over the preceding four years had had turned the media into a um uh, a sort of opposite an antimatter version of himself if you like <laughs> that's a good way of putting it um and then president biden didn't do a huge amount at first but then suddenly was it last year or 2021 around the time you were writing your book i think there was a change and he said actually we need to look into this what what do you think happened there well, the 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 breakthrough in, in as I say, May 2021 was a group of 30 senior and respected scientists writing to Science, the, the journal, saying, "Look, we do have to take this seriously because the evidence is accumulating." And the trigger for that, curiously, was the World Health Organization's visit to Wuhan and its investigation, which was such a farce that it backfired. Uh, the World Health Organization took six months to negotiate entry to Wuhan. Then when they got there, spent two weeks in quarantine before they were allowed out their hotel rooms, and then spent 10 days visiting various sites in Wuhan, including a museum to celebrate the success of the Chinese regime in defeating COVID and things like that. So it was a Potemkin visit, if you like. They spent three hours at the lab. They asked some polite questions. They were shown the... Uh, by biosafety level four lab which is not the one where this could have happened the work on these viruses was done at biosafety levels two and three um, so it was an irrelevant lab to be shown uh, and they um they failed to ask even uh, why that lab had not uh, shared its database of all the viruses it was working on uh, and they then held a press conference at which they said a lab leak was extremely unlikely those were their words uh, and that um uh, much more likely was that the thing had arrived in Wuhan from abroad on frozen food, uh, a theory that the Chinese regime was trying to push at the time, and which is makes absolutely no sense and for which there is absolutely no evidence. So the, in bending over backwards to do the Chinese bidding, the World Health Organization actually did us a favor by causing a backlash among sensible scientists uh, elsewhere in the world who then wrote this letter to nature saying this has got to be taken seriously and the biden administration which was sitting on some slightly better intelligence that it had inherited from the trump administration uh, then um uh, agreed to uh, look into it but they dragged their feet and when congress passed a law at the end of last year saying you've got six months to release the intelligence you're sitting on uh, they they missed the deadline and eventually produced a um, meaningless brief summary of the intelligence not the actual uh, information themselves and that again backfired because a number of state department and other intelligence officials uh, frustrated by the biden administration's refusal to release this stuff because at the time they were trying to get Anthony Blinken into China to see Xi Jinping, so they didn't want to offend China. Um, a number of officials then released the names of the three researchers who they say got sick in twenty uh, in November 2019. And these proved to be very important names. These were the people doing the very research that we are concerned about. Now, that's a really important point, and it's worth emphasising for people who are listening to this who are not familiar with the story, are not biochemists. There are three guys who have actually been collecting a, a SARS COVID 2 virus, taking it to the lab, and then guess what? They get some strange pneumonia disease. Did they survive, or 
As far as we can tell, they're all still alive. Right. They're all young people, so you wouldn't expect them to die from, from COVID. Um, ben Hu was the main uh, laboratory researcher working on these SARS-related virus experiments for uh, Xi Zheng Li, the head of the lab. Uh, um, Yu Ping was a, uh, a field researcher who was collecting uh, viruses in the wild and bringing them back to the lab, and had and her thesis or his thesis, I don't actually know what gender Yu Ping is. I haven't been able to establish that. But the thesis was um, uh, that um, uh, the thesis published evidence of n uh, uh, nine critically important viruses very closely related to SARS-CoV-2 that they had collected from one mine shaft in southern Yunnan, about um, 1,800 kilometers by road from Wuhan, uh, and brought back to the Wuhan lab. So we knew the name of Yu Ping already as a very important figure in this, because th that thesis had been smoked out. It, it, eight of those viruses had never been mentioned before, uh, and turned out to be really quite important. They're called the 7896 group because of one of the serial numbers on one of the viruses. Um, the third member who got sick uh, in November 2019, according to the American intelligence officials, you know, I can't verify that either way, um, was Yan Zhou, who was uh, the chief experimentalist in the lab. So these are, you know, the three most likely people, um, if you like, or three of the five or six most likely people you would expect to fall sick from this. Now, they were sick enough to be hospitalized according to the reports. Uh, they had ground glass opacities in their lungs, which is a characteristic diagnostic feature of COVID, again, according to these intelligence reports. Um, but they, uh, the Chinese authorities have since said, and Ben, who gave an interview to Science Magazine, uh, to say he has tested negative for COVID-19. Well, uh, perhaps... We don't know, so we can't we can't be absolutely sure that that uh, that these people fell ill with COVID. They might have had flu. They might have had nothing wrong with them, and the whole thing is a is a misdirected rumor from from a source that the intelligence sources rely on. Um, but they claim it's a good source, uh, and they claim something happened around that. Now, the dates are quite important here. September 2019, something happened in the lab. They withdrew the database with 22,000 entries, which included a comprehensive list of all the viruses they'd been working on from public access. Some of it was already password protected, but they withdrew the whole database and they never brought it back online. That's not quite true. It was available internally again for a period uh, at the start of the pandemic, but no outsiders were allowed access to it. It then disappeared again. Uh, uh, now, that the point of that database was to predict and prevent the next pandemic. Here are all the viruses we're working on uh, to try and make sure we can see the next pandemic coming. A pandemic comes along. You've been collecting these thousands of viral samples. You've been analyzing them, sequencing them, doing all sorts of things on them. And far from sharing it with the world, you say, right, no, nothing to see here. Uh, it's, it's secret. That's a terribly suspicious thing to do. But that and was around, the, around the same time as three of the people working at the coal. Well, it was it was earlier. Ill earlier. Few months, it was earlier. Few That's early. the right. the puzzle. It was in September. Oh, I see. That was um, November, wasn't it? Sick enough. And the the apparently they got sick in November. Um, uh, the other thing that did happen, and the intelligence on this is again quite good, is that there was some kind of biosafety alarm in October. Um, there were officials from Beijing who visited the Wuhan lab and said, um, uh, you need to improve your procedures. We're, we're concerned about what's been happening, uh, et cetera. So it, it, and, and, and there were new contracts issued for um, uh, better biosafety equipment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, around that time. So, so something was happening that autumn. They were either – you know, reviewing what they were doing and deciding they needed to improve their procedures routinely, or they were worried because something had happened. 
And if something had happened in September and luckily nobody got sick or, or one person got sick, but it didn't spread, and then it happened again in November or something like that, um, or there was a sort of slow burn, a uh, few people infected, the virus not yet very good at spreading between people, uh, and then suddenly it bursts out in November. Something like that is probably what happened. But we, I, I, I actually try never to speculate too much about this and stick to what we do know rather than what we uh, – what we would so like is it possible, though, you think, that these three six scientists in November, Ben Hu, Yu Ping, and Yan Zhu, they could be, one of one or more of them could be the first person to bring it outside the lab and give it to somebody else by mistake? And that's where it yes. all started. Have it's you, definitely. Have you ever tried to speak to them? I mean, can can people just reach out to people like that in China? Uh, I have not been able to speak to anyone within China with one very interesting exception. Um, over the past three years. The exception <coughs> is a man called George Gao, who was head of the Centers for Disease Control, uh, the National Centers for Disease Control in China, uh, in Beijing, was really the most senior scientist involved in uh, the battle against COVID um, uh, at the start of the pandemic. He's no longer head of the CDC. He attended a meeting in Geneva in April, and I was able to spend half an hour talking to him. Um, very nice man, very affable, very open-minded, said he wanted to join forces with me and write a book about vaccines, much more interesting than the origin of COVID, he said, um, etc. cetera. Um, uh, but he basically said to me, and he repeated the same with an interview with the BBC's John Sudworth, and he said much the same to Catherine Eban of Vanity Fair, that the idea it started in the market can be pretty well ruled out. And he's been saying that since actually May of 2020, when he made an announcement saying it didn't start in the market, um, the seafood market. And when asked, so could it have started in the lab? He generally replies, we have to keep our minds open to all possibilities. Now, because he was quoted as saying something like that um, in Vanity Fair. Um, the Chinese regime immediately got him to row back and said, that's not what I meant, that's not what I said, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, he's clearly under pressure. And, you know, Alina Chan and I were concerned when we talked to him in Geneva that we, we didn't want to um, get him into trouble by passing on what he said which is this why is your co-author by the way in case people don't know Alina chan is the co-author yeah. of yeah. matt's you know really important book um yeah, yeah. and, and very fact, much the the important part of the, the team but it seems to me more and more of evidence is emerging the sunday times insight team did did a piece a few weeks ago and we've had as you say even the head of the fbi coming out saying you know there's no evidence it could have come from from wet market it must have come from the lab and there are even suggestions that it may have had some military this is part of biological warfare. I mean, do you think that's correct? Well, the biological warfare angle is one I, I, I don't feel I know enough to um, be sure about anything. We do know that this was a dual-use laboratory, i.e. The, the military was involved in part of the work in the laboratory. We do know that two very similar viruses were isolated in a in a, a military laboratory in uh, uh uh, on the east coast of China, not very far from Wuhan, but in a different city, um, uh, a few years earlier, not very closely related, but similar sorts of viruses. So that the, there was military interest in this group of viruses. Now, um, what were the uh, bio warfare? What was the bio warfare stance of the uh, Chinese regime? Uh, it was probably defensive. That is to say, just like Britain and the United States, they were more worried about bioterrorism than they were excited about opportunities for using bioweapons in warfare. But of course, there's a blurred line between those two, between defensive and offensive use of, uh, of bioweapons. Um, uh, and the, um, as you say, the Sunday Times uh, dug up some interesting hints that uh before the pandemic began the 
uh, military side of the research had been collaborating quite closely with Xi Jinping's lab. Now, she denied on the record that there was anything to do with uh, the military side in her lab. So there are there are contradictions there that, that need to be taken into account. Once the pandemic began, the entire Wuhan Institute of Virology was put under the command of a major general from the People's Liberation Army. That sounds pretty suspicious until you discover that the major general in question was a, uh, a virologist herself uh, uh, who had worked on biological uh, weapons defense and had um, been in charge of bioterrorism um prevention for the beijing olympics so she's actually quite a relevant person to put in charge of the lab but it nonetheless did coincide with a crackdown on any kind of communication coming out of that lab except with regime approval and have any of the scientists here i mean uh, jeremy farah or or um others involved with the world health organization have they sort of rode back on what they said or have they just been silent? I mean, what was the reaction, for example, to your book? Well, this is the thing that really shocks me, is that we presented in our book comprehensive evidence that, that there was an enormous research program on exactly these kinds of viruses in exactly the time period uh, when you would expect. Uh, and that con in contrast to uh, the wet market, the evidence was uh, pretty strong that something was going on here. And I expected that uh, scientists in the UK, which is a strong biomedical player, probably the second most important biomedical nation in the world, um, would take an interest in this. I wrote to the Royal Society um, and uh, the biological secretary, Linda Partridge, who I'd known for many years and said, um, you know, could we have a debate about this topic? Could the Royal Society organise uh, a, a, a debate in which people on all sides of this thing come together and discuss it? It's probably the most important scientific topic um, of our era. Uh, and she replied, uh, uh, no, we only like to talk about scientific topics. <laughs> right? Well, I thought this was a scientific topic. Um, I approached the Academy of Medical Sciences, which I'm a fellow of, and said, uh, don't you think we should have a debate about this? I'm not saying, you know, endorse one side or other of the argument. Have an open-minded debate on the topic. And the answer was, no, it's too controversial. Well, I thought that was the whole point of debates, was to debate controversial issues. Um, uh, so uh, the, the, the reaction of the scientific establishment has been extraordinarily disappointing. It's in sharp contrast to the reaction of individuals. So I've had many individual scientists say to me, keep going, you're on the right track. We're really worried that this is what happened. It's highly plausible. Um, and some of them have put their heads above the parapet. Uh, uh, professor Anton van der Merwe, the professor of pathology at Oxford, an old friend of George Gauss and a person who who's, knows this topic very well, um, has you know he wrote a letter to the Financial, financial Times and then he uh, has done several other things to, to help us keep this on the boil. So there's plenty of individual scientists. Um, I would say the majority of scientists I talk to who who say um, uh, keep it going. But when it comes to doing anything public, putting their heads above the parapet, or even doing any research on this, you know, I mean, it's the expertise within the Wellcome Trust, within uh, British universities for investigating these matters, for looking into the, the sequences and what they can tell you and what we know about this, nothing's happened. There's been no attempt to investigate what might have happened in that lab. And that, uh, you know, in, in America, because uh, funding was finding its way from the National Institutes of Health to the Wuhan lab to support a lot of this research. There's a sort of reason why they're coy about looking at it, okay? But in Britain, we could be, uh, you know, a, a disinterested party saying, actually, um, we'd like to look into this, and, you know, we don't have skin in the game either way. It's not clear that the Wellcome Trust ever funded uh, the Wuhan lab directly. I don't think it did. So Jeremy Farah, uh, you know, who openly 
almost started the, the concerns right at the start that this might have come from a lab and organized that first phone call with Anthony Fauci and several other senior scientists, um, has never called for any kind of work of this kind. And I don't think that's good enough, frankly. But when your book came out, I mean, it was, what was it, back end of 2021, um, I was checking out some of the reviews this morning. They're very, mostly very positive. The Guardian uh, commissioned somebody to write a review that wasn't particularly positive and seemed to want to paint you as a bit of a kind of conspiracy theory, maybe even a bit of a crank, sorry, to use the C words. Yep. Um, and it's saying actually the real, the real grown-ups in the room say, of course, it was a natural evolution of viruses because, guys, viruses evolve all the time. So, you know, put the thing to bed. It's all fine. Now, that was... 18 months ago, do you think that Guardian reviewer would take the same view of you and your book now? I've no idea. I mean, uh, uh, there's an awful lot of people who, uh, you know, have, once you once you get stuck in a position, it's hard to row back from, and it's very easy to deceive yourself into thinking that that the um, the evidence supports your your point of view so uh, i suspect people aren't changing their minds who took a position early as much as one would like but some people certainly are well that's the we, scientific method isn't it we know we, science shouldn't be clouded by arguments on social media and whether you like donald trump i mean i can't stand donald trump but i'm not going to let hopefully not let it affect my view of where terrifying pandemic comes from and that does seem to have happened it's got sort of political in, the, in that yes really uh, uh, trench I mean, warfare style of today for me, this is one of the shocking aspects, the degree to which uh, scientific debates have become politicized. Uh, scientists are quite prepared to take positions that they um, that, uh, that, that are closed-minded and dogmatic um, uh, and are based on um, uh, their political view of the world rather than their um, uh, uh, genuine assessment of the evidence. I mean, what we tried to do in our book was show, not tell. You know, we didn't say, here's what you should think about this. We said, here's what we found out, lay it out, and then we end up with a couple of chapters, one of which says, look, here's the possibility that it came out of the market, which we can't dismiss, and which is still got some evidence for it. And that's the evidence that we would use if we were in a court of law arguing that it came out of the market. And then in the next chapter, here's the evidence that it came out of the lab and this is what we would say to a jury if we were trying to convince them of that up to you reader to make your mind up and there's a huge disconnect now between what the public thinks which as far as we can make out in most countries certainly in the uk and the us 60 to 70 percent of people think it came from a lab and what the establishment of science thinks which is that it didn't and we can rule that out for certain you know i mean it's, they're not just saying um it probably didn't they're saying we can rule that out um now that disconnect ought to bother scientists if they really think that the public is wrong about this then they ought to be out there making their case instead of which they just want the debate to go away because i mean there was a scientific advisory group for the origins of novel um pathogens which was set up has that actually report done anything or has it just been a sort of window dressing operation say go yeah um it's the in in the wake of the wuhan visit of the world health organization they set up sago um it has gener i mean it's been going now for um two and a bit years it's generated almost nothing of any significance. Um, it had had one or two conferences to talk about the risks of emerging pathogens elsewhere in the world and things like that. But no, I'm afraid it's it's been a, a, a classic uh, WHO sort of um, uh, bureaucratic nonsense involving a lot of business class airfares and not much else. And, and so where do you think we go from here? I mean, are you going to update your book in the light of what's now emerging? Um, are other people going to come forward? I mean, do you think the debate continues? Um, or do we just have to sense, but just assume that that's all over and, and nothing more is going to happen? I remain optimistic that we will eventually know um, what happened. There was a famous anthrax outbreak in 1979 in, in Sverdlovsk in the Soviet Union, which 
uh, was suspected to be from a bioweapons lab, um, killed 65 people. Uh, it was denied. It even survived a um, international scientific visit to see whether it might have been uh, a biowarfare leak. Uh, and, you know, the world said, fine, it, nothing to do. It was just it happened to be some people got anthrax from contaminated meat. Then the Soviet Union collapsed. And by the early 1990s, scientists came forward and said, you're absolutely right. We were working on anthrax. We did leave the um, filter off the exhaust pipe that day by mistake. And we sent a plume of anthrax over the city and we killed 65 people. So the truth eventually came out, but it took 13 years, roughly. Um, so I'm. it may take a change of regime in China, but I think we will eventually know. The other two things that make me optimistic are that uh, Chinese scientists will start to travel abroad in greater numbers now that the pandemic is over. As I say, we've already seen George Gao uh, in the West. Um, uh, and eventually, someone's going to slip through the net and come out who the, the Chinese authorities would prefer didn't turn up in uh, London or Washington and start talking. Um, uh, and I think as it fades from the sort of immediate political thing, uh, Western scientists are going to continue to keep digging. So I, I, I feel optimistic that one day we will be able to resolve this matter. That's really interesting. Um, we're pretty much out of time. I want to read something. I don't know if you wrote it or somebody wrote it about you um, in the review. Imagine a crisp manufacturer keeping potatoes next to a vat of cyanide. And its response to somebody dying from eating crisps is to say, we must find out if this cyanide killed that man, so then we can know whether to move the vat. No, move the bloody vat anyway. <laughs> I'd never heard that. Yes, it <laughs> but seems, seems rather apposite, don't you think? It, 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 well, it's exactly the point that, that there is no real push to stop doing dangerous virology experiments. Um uh, quite the reverse, in fact. I mean, the funding resumed to uh, some of this work, particularly the work of the EcoHealth Alliance in the United States, which is this non-profit body that collaborated with Wuhan, whose job was to go out and find bats all over Southeast Asia, sample them, not always with proper protective gear on, and bring those samples to labs in Wuhan. That was what they were doing on a massive scale. They got their, their funding renewed um, uh, a wow. short time ago to continue doing that kind of thing. Now, they say they'll use a little more protective equipment or something now. But, you know, this is looking for a gas leak with a date with a lighted match. You know, it shouldn't be going on. Need not. Well, maybe uh, well, let's hope there's no more pandemics to talk to you about. But that's something else we should perhaps one day talk to you about. But for now... Thank you so much. That's really thank you. It's brilliant. Really, really at all. Great to talk. And good luck. Good luck with your continuing. And good luck with the book. I hope you update it. Bye. Thank you very much. Goodness me, that was so interesting, wasn't it? Gosh, Harry, I think one of our best. Um, really, really interesting stuff. And I mean, I hope he's going to update his book and uh, and and you know perhaps the the story will 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 develop further. It's so easy, isn't it? To um, judge your opinion of someone based on you know what you might have read on twitter or what you know who their allies may have been in the past and they're just in one camp or another um rather than saying what is the issue at stake in this one particular moment what this particular story um i don't know anybody outside britain won't know what i'm talking about but there's a big row in britain at the moment about nigel farage he was a very controversial figure many people don't like him at all but the principle of whether this man should be thrown out of his bank for his political views you know, some people who are on the left who generally don't like him have said, actually, do you know what? We should stand up for him. Um, others are like, no, he's 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 our enemy. We can't give an inch to our enemies. That's well, exactly. And the 10,000 people who seem to have been denied bank accounts because people didn't like their views. Uh, it seems to be bad, bad, bad economics. Well, I think, but I think what shocked me about the Matt Ridley was that the scientists, uh, you know, who you would think would deal with this in a very measured way, are not addressing the problem even now. It's... Mm. You know, it's clearly quite corrupt the way that the funding is done. People are clearly worried about international relations. The Chinese have been let off the hook. Uh, and uh, I think people have forgotten about it. We've got big inquiries about COVID, but actually the most seems to be one of the key things is how did it start? And you, 
um, because this would help prevent it in the future. Well, um, I used to work in television. Um, still have many, many friends. I've done lots of science documentaries and run series about scientific subjects. And I've heard that commissioning editors are, uh, that have got big presences, uh, companies have got presences in China, are very, very reluctant to commission documentaries on what is the biggest science stories of our lives. It's remarkable. Oh, sure. So funding, I think, is at the heart of a lot of these things. Yeah. And I think what's very interesting is if he's saying people are eventually coming to the West, even if they're not speaking publicly, they're perhaps having conversations behind the scenes. And so the stories will eventually come out, even if they're disguised. I really hope so. I really hope so. Shall we talk a little bit more about next week's show? Because um, this is one of those where I've forgotten who it is. I think we mentioned it the other it's day. It's Laura Thompson, a, a second person who's coming back uh, for right. a second time. But That's this is something people have asked for. It's a very different sort of subject. It'll be interesting to see what scandals there are there. I mean, I'm fascinated by Unity, one of the sisters, uh, and 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 her death and her involvement with with Hitler. Um, but they're all rather fascinating. You know, and Diana, of course, is only just not Diana. Uh, what's the one who married the Duke of Devonshire? Uh, Debo has only just died. I need to do some research on it before next week. But yeah, for people outside the Britain, book. they are very famous. A group of sisters who were high society got involved in politics and uh, had relationships with people from the far left and the far right. And there was one of them in particular, um, very close to Hitler, possibly even one of Hitler's lovers, it is suggested. Yeah, yeah, I know. A very interesting group. Um, uh, of people. We've talked and before about the aristocracy at that time, and you've done your work about Edward VIII and the extent of the sympathy for Nazism uh, in the 1930s and how that played out and how that could have been a, a devastating um, problem for Churchill yeah. when, he, when he takes power. Yeah, no, it, it raises all sorts of interesting issues. And of course, Jessica, the communist living in the States. Um, uh, so it's, it's, I know that her book has done very well in the States. So I, I think it's a subject will interest our American listeners, um, as well as our British and Australian ones. Sex, celebrity, death, war, the rise and fall of empires. What's not to like? It's what we what we try and provide every week. <laughs> well, I hope people have enjoyed this one. I shall look forward to joining you to talk sex and scandal and Aristos next week. Absolutely. And thank you so much for all your support. We're really encouraged by it. Oh, yeah. And thanks to all the listeners and viewers who sent such some lovely messages. Um, and uh, defended Andrew when others have tried to tear him down. Thank you for listening to the Scandalmongers podcast. This has been a podcast world production. You can get in contact with our show by emailing team at podcastworld.org, placing Scandalmongers in the heading, or via our social media links within the show's bio. 